so things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn, a bump, a darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. That's all you get. Yeah. We, okay, we're going to do it again. So things haven't turned out as you hoped. Life took a turn, a bump, a darkened sky. And at times it may have seemed there was no hope. But here's the good news. Our God is the God of fresh starts. Our God is the God of new beginnings. Our God brings new mercies, new compassions, not just once a year, not just when things are bad, but every single morning. This season has been tough. And for many of us, things will never be the same. But we are here, breathing, maybe smiling, or crying, or shouting, or laughing. But we are here, feeling, maybe fighting, or cheering, or seeking, or grieving, but we are here. here. Our God is with us. And our God is the God of new creations. Author Bob Goff once said, loving people the way Jesus did means living a life of being constantly misunderstood. No one, not one single person understood Jesus when he began his ministry on earth. And truth be told, they didn't understand him at the end of his ministry on earth either, as we'll see in our story today. He was as misunderstood at the end of his time here as he was from the first, and it's because of the way he lived his life that no one understood him, not the crowds, not the religious rulers, not the Roman government officials, not the disciples, not the bystanders, not the others being crucified next to him. No one understood what Jesus was doing or why he was doing it. In fact, it wasn't until after his death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, and really after Pentecost, that his own followers began to fully understand all that Jesus did and taught. It wasn't until then that they understood why he lived the way that he did. And then after that, no one understood his disciples because as soon as they got it, they began living the same way Jesus did when he was here. Okay, the reality is the life of a follower of Christ, if you're living it like he did, is a lifetime of being misunderstood by those who do not know him. And the struggle with that for many of us is the fact that often we want to be understood more than we want to be like Jesus. 
Again, Bob Goff said everybody wants to make a difference in the world. Only a few people want to be different than the world. Yet living like Jesus lived, listen, it necessarily means being different than the world. There's no way around it, which also means you will unquestionably be as misunderstood today when you live like Jesus did as his disciples were then. Jesus was pretty clear about that. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Right? He, he, he didn't say the world might hate you. He said, because you're not of the world, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me, John 15, 19 through 21. The idea that you can live your life like Jesus did and at the same time be fully accepted into popular culture is entirely incompatible with the reality of what Jesus taught and certainly what he demonstrated in his own life. And listen, uh, the reason Jesus didn't fit in with the culture around him was not because he was a, a, a rule follower, right? The Pharisees followed rules better than anyone and they were at the center of Jewish culture. It wasn't simply because he was a religious person. Again, there were uh, religious people from many different religions in the ancient world who were accepted into mainstream culture. It wasn't because he was a rebel. There were plenty of popular figures at the time who led rebellions around the time of Jesus, certainly among the Jews. So what was it about Jesus that made him not fit in? What kept him on the outside of popular culture and ultimately drove people to hate him? To hate him so much, in fact, they killed him. It's because he told them the truth. It's because he loved people enough to tell them the truth, even when the truth was the last thing they wanted to hear. Right? Everybody loves the Jesus that heals people. Everybody loves the Jesus that feeds people. Everybody loves the Jesus that forgives people. It's the Jesus that tells them they need to be healed and need to be fed and need to be forgiven that they hate. Because the truth forces us to confront the desperate need that sin creates in our own hearts, which makes us very uncomfortable. Right? To the church. Jesus said, you say I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody. And yet not only do we need to hear that, but it was spoken out of a profound love for us. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent, Revelation three seventeen through 19. Do you see every hard word Jesus ever spoke was spoken out of a profound love for people, for you and for me. And yet, as his word makes clear, the majority of people who hear that truth not only refuse to accept it, but they actually hate him for saying it. Here's the harsh reality that you and I have to accept about that. If you're going to live like Jesus lived, then you're going to have to tell people the truth even when the truth is the last thing they want to hear, and no matter how compassionate you are in sharing that truth, listen, the majority of people will not only refuse to accept it, many of them will actually hate you for saying it. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. There's no way around it. Being a follower of Christ, truly following Jesus, means at times in your life you're going to be rejected by others and even hated by some. And so, listen, if you can't remember the last time you were rejected, shunned, 
excluded, pushed away, even hated by someone because you love them enough to share the truth about Jesus with them, even though that was the last thing they wanted to hear. If you can't remember the last time you were misunderstood because you were following Jesus, then maybe you're not following him. Because he said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you on account of my name. Right? Maybe, maybe you want to be included, accepted, understood by others more than you want to be like Jesus. That's why his disciples ran in every direction but his when Jesus was arrested instead of following him because they didn't want to be hated by the world the way that Jesus was hated. They didn't want to suffer rejection and persecution for being associated with him, so they pretended they were not associated with him. And look, the truth is not a lot has changed in that regard because sadly there are many believers today who claim to follow Christ and yet when confronted with an opportunity to share that truth with others, you wouldn't have the slightest idea that they have any association with Christ at all. Why? Because they want to be understood and accepted by the world more than they want to be like Christ. But listen, at, at some point, if you're going to actually follow Jesus, you have to be okay with being misunderstood and accept that if they persecuted him, at some point they're going to persecute you on account of his name, which is the cost of sharing the truth with this world. Deep misunderstanding by people who will even hate you at times for telling them the truth when that is the last thing they want to hear, and yet that is exactly what real love looks like which Jesus makes abundantly clear, by the way, in our story today, as we continue to study our way through the gospel according to Mark. So let's pick it back up where we left off last week and see what Jesus has to teach us about how to stand for truth in this world, even when that means being deeply misunderstood by those who do not wish to hear it. Mark chapter 15, we'll begin with the first 15 verses. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, and what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. If you were here last week, you'll remember that Jesus was taken into custody in the Garden of Gethsemane and subjected to a late-night trial before the high priest replete with false witnesses and false testimonies to try and convict him of bogus charges. Nevertheless, when uh, asked by the high priest if he was in fact the Christ, Jesus replied, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, Mark fourteen sixty two. And we talked about that last week, which was all the testimony the high priest needed to convict Jesus of blasphemy and condemn him to death for claiming to be the Messiah, even though we know that he was. So in spite of all of the fruitless testimony of many others, all it took to condemn Jesus was his own testimony, even though his testimony was true. Because the last thing the Jewish leadership wanted to hear was the truth. And they certainly didn't understand who, who Jesus actually was, even though he told them who he was. And so they condemn him to death. However, because Israel was subject to Roman control, the Jewish leadership did not have the authority to actually carry out the execution of the condemned. The, uh, the right of the sword, as it was legally referred to at the time, was reserved for the Roman provincial authorities. 
which meant the Jewish religious leadership had to take Jesus to Pilate, who was the fifth Roman governor or prefect of Judea. He ruled from AD 26 to AD 37. His responsibility, among other things, was to hear such cases and then pass judgment on them, which he typically did at daybreak because that's when the working day of a Roman official started. So very early in the morning, they bring Jesus to Pilate. And we know from the first century Jewish historians, both Philo of Alexandria and Flavius Josephus, that Pilate was a cruel and ruthless leader who despised the Jews. In fact, uh, during his tenure in Judea, he was known for putting down political insurrections and protests by the Jews in brutal fashion, which plays significantly into this story because in verse 64 of the last chapter, Jesus was convicted specifically of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious ruling council, including the high priest. And yet, when they bring him before Pilate, there's no mention of blasphemy, only of Jesus being the king of the Jews. Because although Pilate, a Roman governor, couldn't care less about Jewish theological and religious crimes, he cared immensely about anything that might challenge Caesar's rule, which in the eyes of Rome was a capital offense. And so accusing Jesus of claiming to be the king of the Jews had the potential to resonate politically with Pilate in a way that the charge of blasphemy never could. And so he simply asked Jesus, because clearly they've, they've accused him of this, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you've said so, meaning yes, I am. And yet even at that, Pilate could tell that this was a setup by the Jewish leaders, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. And so he tries to encourage Jesus to defend himself in verse 4. Uh, in Luke's account of this same story, he tells us that Pilate declares to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man, Luke 23, 4. Matthew tells us in his gospel that Pilate's wife sent word to her husband, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream, Matthew 27, 19. And in Matthew 27, 24, Pilate declares to the crowd, I am innocent of this man's blood. Yet he sees one last potential opportunity to let Jesus off the hook, as was Pilate's custom during the Passover celebration every year, to release with full amnesty one prisoner who the Jews requested. So he assumes the crowd will want Jesus released since he found no fault in him. But the religious leaders stir up the people to ask for the release of a murderer named Barabbas instead, sending Jesus to the cross. And all the while, Jesus does nothing to defend himself or to plead his case, to which, according to Mark, Pilate was amazed. He was amazed because he didn't know the truth. Pilate didn't know who Jesus was and why it was necessary for him to do what he'd come here to do, as Jesus said back in chapter 14, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. You see, Jesus was misunderstood by Pilate, who thought Jesus was merely a pawn in the Jewish religious leader's plan to kill him out of jealousy. Pilate saw Jesus the prisoner, but he failed to recognize Jesus the king, which is exactly what so many people fail to recognize about Jesus in large part today, because we don't tell them. We love to talk about Jesus, the benevolent friend, Jesus, the social justice warrior, Jesus, the miracle worker, Jesus, the carpenter, Jesus, the provider, and so on, as we should, because he's all of that and more. But listen, the only reason any of that carries any weight at all is because Jesus is the king. But we don't talk about that nearly as much because describing Jesus as our king naturally implies that we are his subjects, which we are. And yet that sounds very authoritarian and heavy and charged with responsibility on our part toward him, which it is. And yet since being the subject of a king doesn't really fit in very well with the American cultural narrative which champions self-reliance and self-determination and self-rule, we'd much rather talk about this kind, wise, and loving soul that wants to put blessings on us rather than a king who wants to rule over us. And I understand that, but look, if Jesus is king, 
than for no other reason than the fact that he exists, created all of this and all of us and is sovereign over everything and everyone for no other reason than his existence and rule as king over all. You understand we owe him all of our devotion and worship. We'll get into what he did for us in a moment. But look, all throughout the New Testament, when it says that Jesus ascended to heaven, it doesn't say he ascended to a stage where he could be popular. No, it says he ascended to a throne where he could rule. Hebrews 1.3 says he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, Jesus ascended to a throne in order to rule. And so simply by the fact that there is a king who upholds the universe by the word of his power, don't you think that is reason enough to give him all of our devotion and all of our worship? Now here's the point. When we share the truth, the gospel, with people, It is critical to their eternity that we not only tell them what he did for us, but that we tell them who he actually is, the King of kings and Lord of lords through whom all things, including you and me, were created. And by that fact alone, we owe him our devotion and worship. Remember, uh, your testimony is your story. The gospel is his story. And so, yes, we should absolutely share our testimony, our story with others, but that is not the same as sharing the gospel with them. We get confused about that a lot. Because your testimony focuses on what he did for you, while the gospel focuses on who he is and what he's done for this world. And people need to hear that because you can tell them all about what Jesus has done for you, which, again, is good, and you should do that. But I can't tell you how many times I've done that and people smile and nod and say something to the effect of, uh, that's great, Rob, that's, that's great that Jesus did that for you. But that doesn't mean I, I need him to do that for me. I'm doing just fine without him. Okay, listen, when we frame the gospel in a context that paints Jesus as someone who wants to do something for you, if you'll just choose to follow him, Right? And then if not, maybe you're going to miss out on his goodness and blessing. Then what you're saying to people is, Jesus is optional. He's a choice that you get to make. Which is a grave misunderstanding with eternal implications. Which is why it is so profoundly important that we explain to people that there is a day coming. A day that no one can stop from coming whether we like it or not or believe in it or not. There is a day coming when at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Philippians 2, 10 and 11. When you explain to someone that Jesus is actually the king over all of creation, all of a sudden, he isn't optional anymore. He isn't isn't one of many gods or one of many paths or one of many philosophies or one of many worldviews or one of many lifestyles to choose from. No, Jesus is the king of all kings and Lord of all lords before whom Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his lordship over them. And of course, uh, course you can rebel against his authority and rule, but that doesn't make him any less of a king. You can choose not to believe in him. That doesn't make him any less of a king. You can tell yourself that day isn't coming, but that doesn't make it any less of a reality. The fact that you will recognize Jesus as king, whether you want to or not. And listen, you can tell people all of that with great compassion and kindness. And they may or may not accept it. But you understand you still have to tell them. Because the gospel is about more than just what Jesus did for us. It's about who he is Not an option for us to choose, but a king for us to serve. Egyptian-born pastor Michael Youssef said, while many try to ignore Jesus when he returns in power and might, this will be impossible. Right? Well, 19th century British preacher William Tiptap once wrote, if you had a thousand crowns, you should put them all on the head of Christ. 
And if you had a thousand tongues, they should all sing his praise, for he is worthy. Let's keep reading, verses 16 through 32. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace that is the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! They were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. With him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. Having been condemned by Pilate, who didn't understand who Jesus was, he was then scourged, which was beyond horrible. Uh, The prisoner was tied to a post, stripped bare while a guard would lash the prisoners back with a braided leather whip that had pieces of bone and metal inserted into the leather braids. The lashings would literally tear chunks of flesh off of the prisoner's body in order to humiliate and weaken them. Two in the back and one on the chest. Two in the back and one on the chest. In fact, in many cases, the prisoner never made it to the crucifixion having died from the scourging itself. But as Jesus survived that portion of his punishment, he was taken to the governor's headquarters, known as the Praetorium, part of Herod's palace, where they called together the entire battalion or garrison of soldiers, known as a spira in the ancient Greek. It was one-tenth of a Roman legion, the legion being 6,000 soldiers. So this was a tenth or 600 Roman soldiers come together to brutally torture and mock Jesus. You know, when you see it in the movies and the dramas, there's 20 or 30 soldiers there beating and mocking. There were 600 soldiers torturing Jesus after his scourging. Why? Because they didn't understand who he was. And so they wrapped his naked, bleeding body in a purple cloak, which was the color reserved for royalty, and in imitation of the gilded wreaths, which was the insignia of the Hellenistic vassal kings in antiquity, according to second century B.C. writings of the Maccabees, the soldiers then twisted together a makeshift crown of acanthus or palm spines, which have two to three inch long thorns, and they pressed it down into his head. Then they continued to mock him and spit on him and beat him in the head mercilessly because they didn't understand who Jesus was. Then after putting his own clothes back on him, they led him out to be crucified. And typically the prisoner who was to be crucified was compelled to carry his own cross, more specifically the horizontal cross beam, which was then affixed to the vertical beam At the crucifixion site, however, Jesus was too weakened by the scourging and further beatings to carry his own cross. So a passerby, a man that must have been familiar uh, to Mark's readers given his specific description of the man's identity, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, a diaspora Jew returning to Jerusalem from the country, was compelled by the Roman soldiers to carry Jesus' cross for him. And uh, just a side note, a point of interest, not only did the Apostle Paul send greetings to Rufus in the church in Rome in Romans uh, 16.13, which is noteworthy because Mark was writing this gospel to the Christians in Rome who would have known Rufus and his brother Alexander and his father Simon of Cyrene, but also uh, a burial cave that was used in the first century prior to the destruction of the temple and belonging to a family of Cyrenian Jews was discovered by Israeli archaeologists on the southwestern slope of the Kidron Valley in November of Uh, 1941, which has the inscription on it written twice in the ancient Greek, Alexander, son of Simon. 
So it's just a bit of interesting evidence once again that we point out often where archaeology and other historical records seem to agree with, if not confirm, the accounts recorded in biblical scripture. So, so Jesus is led out to Golgotha, the crucifixion site where he's offered a mix of wine and myrrh, which was a narcotic intended to dull uh, the prisoner's senses to alleviate at least a measure of even the greater pain he was about to endure on the cross. It was one, if not the only, consideration given to those who were crucified, and yet Jesus refuses to take it because he was choosing to willingly accept the full measure of suffering that crucifixion would bring. And then they divided his garments in fulfillment of the prophecy in Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. And then Jesus is crucified. He's nailed to a Roman cross with the inscription, the King of the Jews, written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, fixed to the vertical beam of the cross, according to John's gospel, just to be certain everyone there could read it. So they, they correctly label the inscription having no idea just how right they were. And death by crucifixion was generally uh, death by asphyxiation because the victim was hanging there, which put significant pressure on the chest cavity to the point that after a period of time you could no longer breathe. And so when people were uh, crucified in ancient Roman provinces, the cross would have a small platform at the level of the victim's feet attached to it so that every time the condemned person would stop breathing, they would involuntarily push up with their feet and open their chest cavity and begin breathing again, which wasn't an act of mercy on the executioner's part. You understand it was an act of torture to prolong the suffering as long as possible preventing a quick death. And yet, if they did need to expedite the process of dying for some reason, as they did in Jesus' case, because according to Jewish law in Deuteronomy 21, 23, if anyone was put to death and hung on a tree, the body had to be taken down the same day. It couldn't remain hanging there overnight. Otherwise, the land, according to the Mosaic law, would be defiled. So they would, in that case, as they did with Jesus, smash the victim's legs with an iron mallet which would preclude the person on the cross from being able to push up with their feet anymore, thereby causing them to stop breathing and suffocate to death much faster. And as he suffered, one brutal injustice after another, they all mocked him. From the Roman soldiers to the Jewish leaders to the people walking by, even the other men being crucified with him, they all saw Jesus the condemned. But they didn't understand he was also Jesus the Christ. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds. We're healed, Isaiah 53, 5. This is the part of the story where we talk about not only who Jesus is, but what he did for us. Because if there is any other way on earth, listen, if there's any other way on earth to obtain eternal life apart from Jesus Christ, if there's any other religion, any other uh, pathway to enlightenment, any other way to live your life that gets you to heaven, to life after this life, then Jesus didn't need to die on a cross. Or if the reward of heaven is granted to us as long as our good deeds outweigh our bad in this life. If we have no need for a savior, then listen, everything Jesus went through was a complete waste of a perfectly good life. So why did Jesus do what he did? Because no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood in their paths. A ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans three ten through 18. You understand every single one of us was born into sin, and without Christ, every single one of us will die in our sin. Without Christ, there's no hope. There's no promise. There's no healing. There's no salvation. There's no redemption. There is no purpose. There is no future. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, without Christ, we have nothing to hope for. But with him, because he did what none of us could do, because he paid the ultimate price for our sins, suffering the wrath of the Father with Christ, we have a future and a hope. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Romans 6, 20 through 23. Listen, next to talking about Jesus the King, probably the hardest part of sharing the gospel with unbelievers is the reason we need Jesus the Christ. It's because of our sin. And of course, no one wants to talk about sin, but you have to talk about it. You have to point people to the clarity of Scripture in regard to their own sin because, look, you can talk about uh, the love of Christ all day long, and you should but without an admission of sin. You understand the love of Christ may be nice, but it isn't necessary. Right? Our desperate need for the love of Christ is due to the desperation of our sin. But if you're not willing to point that out to others, their own dire and imminent need for God's love and mercy and grace for salvation because of their own sin, then following Jesus becomes optional. But it's not optional. Unless you want to die in your sin and be eternally separated from God, then Jesus Christ is not an option for you because He is the only way to salvation. So many people I meet don't understand their need for Christ because they don't understand the desperation of their own sin. And yet, how will they know if we don't tell them? 17th century English preacher Thomas Brooks once said, Our sins are debts that none can pay but Christ. It is not our tears but His blood. It is not our sighs but His sufferings that can testify for our sins. Christ must pay for all, or we are prisoners forever. Let's finish the story for today, verse 33 to the end of the chapter. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lame us the back tonight, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he's calling Elijah. And some ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, distance among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. In many ways, the women who followed Jesus were far more bold than the men. And when evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So Jesus dies on the cross, and although... Uh, listen, we don't have time to go through every prophecy of this event. It fulfilled every one with stunning detail. And yet more importantly, this wasn't merely a death. It was a breathtakingly supernatural event 
with several accompanying signs. From noon until 3 p.m., the middle of the day, the light of the sun was blotted out and darkness enveloped the land, which, to be clear, was no solar eclipse. An eclipse lasts for a few minutes, and the darkness is not deep. This was a thick, all-encompassing, oppressive darkness as the wrath of God was brought to bear onto Jesus with full force. Secondly, the temple veil, which was often said to represent the heavens themselves, was described, in fact, by uh, Josephus as 80 feet in height, which he also describes, and I'm quoting, he describes it as a Babylonian tapestry with embroidery of blue and fine linen, of scarlet also and purple, wrought with marvelous skill, nor was the mixture of materials without its mystic meaning. It typified the universe. And so this, this massive, immensely thick and heavy veil was torn from top to bottom as Jesus breathed his last. And Matthew tells us in his gospel account, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Can you imagine the Old Testament saints getting up out of the graves and walking around the moment Jesus passed from this life to the next when the centurion and those who were with them keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place they were filled with awe and said truly this was the son of God you think so Matthew 27 51 through 53 for the first time the people present began to recognize something supernatural was happening and yet even at that They may have recognized Jesus, the Son of God, but they had yet to understand that he was Jesus, the Conqueror. If you were here in April during Resurrection Sunday, then you've heard me talk about this before, so forgive me, but I'm going to talk about it again because it is so profoundly important in understanding what Jesus was actually accomplishing that fateful day on the cross. Mark says that Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, it's Hebrew, For my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I have to be honest with you, after everything that Jesus did, right, understanding who he was, him understanding who he was, and the fact that he was not only going to die for mankind, but he understood exactly why. I always thought it was a bit anticlimactic that the Son of God, who with all of his wisdom and all of his understanding, not just in general, But in that very specific situation, knowing exactly why he was there and what he was accomplishing by being there, knowing, by the way, that he was going to rise from the dead, it always felt like a bit of a letdown to me that Jesus would spend his final breath questioning the Father. Right When you think about people who are being executed and they're given a chance to offer their final words, at least from those who are uh, in their right minds, You expect their deepest, innermost thoughts. You expect them to muster up the most profound and meaningful statement they can give in that one moment. And it's quite interesting, in fact, if you read some of those statements that have been made by people who were about to be executed over the years, uh, because you know they've had a long time to think about what was going to happen to them. And indeed, some of those final words are very uh, compelling, very deep, very thought-provoking. Some of them are quite profound. And so I guess I always expected more of that from Jesus, who had plenty of time to think about what he would say in that moment. He he knew why he was there. He knew he was going to rise from the dead. And yet what I would read in the Gospels always seemed more of a really sad expression of confused bewilderment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so for most of my life in church, I heard it explained because Jesus was shouldering the sin of the world that in that moment he had to be cut off from fellowship with the Father who in his holiness could not look upon the sin of the world. And since Jesus couldn't somehow fathom that, he questions the Father in that final moment of his life on earth. And again, just to be honest, that always left me with a a bit of a sense of defeat 
even though I knew that Jesus rose from the dead and conquered sin and death, that moment of triumph, that moment of triumph over the grave at Jesus' last gasp always felt like a bit of a defeat to me as Jesus himself questioned the Father's absence. That's what I believed for most of my life. But the truth is, there's so much more to what was actually happening in that moment than Jesus simply being bewildered by the Father and turning away from sin. In fact, what was really happening was not at all what I thought or what I was taught, which is at best an incomplete picture and quite possibly a total misunderstanding of that passage. Okay, In the first century, the scripture that people had and knew for the most part was the Old Testament scripture. And some of the most commonly quoted and well-known passages of scripture at the time were the Psalms, which of course are songs. The word Psalm means hymn. These were songs that were sung and taught and quoted by God's people, even to their children growing up all of the time. And if you think about a really famous song from our lifetime, right, a song that everyone would know really well, you can simply hear just the first line of that song and nothing else, and immediately you know what song that is, and you know what that song is about. You understand the message of that song. You understand how it makes you feel all just by hearing the first line of the song because you're so familiar with it. It's like the show, if you're, if you're as old as me or older, you probably remember the show Name That Tune, right? Where they would play the first line of a song and the person listening would have to guess the name of the song. And of course, the more well-known the song, the easier it was to name the song. That's, that's how music works in general. The more you hear it, the more it stays with you to the point that just hearing the first line of a song can instantly recall the entire piece, right? If, if someone sings, oh, say, can you see, right? Just by hearing the first line of that song, you know what that song is. You know what it's about. You could probably even begin to feel the emotions that it stirs up inside of you and the, the grateful sense of wonder and awe for the victories won and the privilege of living in such an amazing country and all of that just from hearing the first line of that song. And here's why that matters. Because Psalm 22 is one of those songs. It's one of the songs that was taught in Jesus' day, a well-known song that starts out as a great lament about suffering that happens to end in great victory over one's enemies. In fact, Psalm 22 was well-known as a song about victory even in the very worst circumstances when it seems the whole world is turned against you. Psalm 22 was the ultimate cry of victory over the enemy. And again, this song of victory was taught over and over and over again from children all the way into adulthood. Well-known at the time Jesus was hanging there on the cross. In fact, John points out in his gospel that Jesus fulfilled Psalm 22:15 in his great thirst just before dying so let's put the beginning of psalm 22 up on the screen so you can read that first line with me my god my god why have you forsaken me you understand when jesus was dying on that cross he wasn't using his final breath on earth to express some kind of doubt or defeat or bewilderment with the Father, no, as he felt his life slipping away with one final breath in his lungs, he cries out the first line of one of the greatest songs about victory over our enemy that has ever been written. Jesus was quoting a very familiar line to a very familiar song. He was making a statement to the world in that moment, both to those there that day witnessing his death and to everyone after who would ever read this account of Jesus' crucifixion that in that very moment, in the worst circumstances that anyone could ever fathom having to face, Jesus was claiming victory for all who would ever call upon his name forevermore. And then seconds later, the victory was won. Can you feel the gravity of what was happening in that moment from what seemed to be a sad statement of defeat to what is actually the greatest victory cry in the history of humankind? Because Jesus understood who he was. 
He understood what he'd come here to do and he understood exactly what was happening in that very moment. While dying on the cross with his final breath, he proclaims victory over death. Listen, not just victory over his own death, but victory over death for all who would ever dare to meet him at the cross. Which means dying to ourselves, taking up our own cross every day, and following him, which is not a popular message or one that is particularly easy to share, but it must be shared, right? If we claim to love God, then we have to share the message of truth with others, even when the truth is the very last thing they want to hear. Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar once said, it is to the cross that the Christian is challenged to follow his master. No path of redemption can make a detour around it. The message of Jesus, who he is, what he came to do, and what he actually accomplished is not always an easy message to share, and it is certainly not always an easy message to hear, because it forces us to confront what's in our own hearts. And look, when uh, when you go around saying things, having conversations that cause people to examine themselves before you and God and whoever else may be there, you're not going to win a lot of friends that way. In fact, some of those people will hate you for it, just like they hated Jesus for it. But listen, the idea that you can live your life like Jesus did and at the same time be fully accepted into popular culture is entirely incompatible with the reality of what Jesus taught and as we've seen, what he demonstrated in his own life. To follow Christ, to live like he lived, is to be misunderstood. But I'm telling you, if you love people, If you love people, even when they don't love you back, you will tell them the truth, even when the truth is the very last thing they want to hear. Otherwise, how will they know who Jesus is? How will they know what he came to do? How will they know what he accomplished for them? How will they know if we don't tell them? Let's pray.